if you say prohibition is bad, you don't necessarily have to say drugs are good. But they are. Good evening and welcome to this month's uh, Expo Winner Wednesday Burger panel discussion. Um, topic, topic tonight is uh, drugs in Berlin um, in correlation with uh, the May issue of our magazine which you may have seen and if you haven't seen it yet you can grab a copy at the door here. Um, just, just wanted to mention that it, it's starting a little late because there's a band from Norway, I believe, and they're called Lady Moscow, so you're free to stick around and enjoy the band afterwards. Um, so my name's Maurice Frank, I'm from Expo Liner Magazine, and I'm going to just briefly introduce my other guests, uh, the, the guests tonight. So on the right we've got uh, Tibor Ara. He's a member of the Green Party, who works for the Green Party on drug policy in Berlin. Um, then we, to his right, to his left, we've got Ruby, uh, Ruby Simmons. He's an English writer who has a lot, a lot of stories to tell about um, drug scene in Berlin. And. Uh, Finally, we've got uh, Stefan Geyer. Uh, Stefan is the director, I believe, of the Hanf, Hanf Museum, or the Hemp Museum in Berlin. Um, they also organize the Hemp Parade and, and many other activities. So, starting off tonight, I wanted to maybe ask our guest, guest to first uh, introduce, talk a little bit talk a little bit about what they do, like why they're here tonight, and like what they're, well, actually just introducing, maybe just wanted to say, for, for a lot of foreigners coming to Berlin, young people coming here, Berlin has this very, this sort of reputation of being a very liberal place where it's easy to find drugs, you can consume them without much hassle, um, sort of a very progressive, very tolerant place, and, and so we're trying to explore this idea of Berlin and, and whether it's true, um, what's really going on here behind, behind the scenes. Um, and so we've got these three voices. And let's start with you, Tibor. Maybe you can just explain um, what you do and the different initiatives you're involved in. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm Tibor. I'm a pharmacist and a toxicologist. Um, I deal with drugs in a scientific way first, and uh, at second, um, I am a member of the Prevention Club. Um, in the 90s, after the wall in Berlin was falling down, here in Berlin, especially in this area here, grows up a big party techno scene. And in this party a techno scene, and new drugs, new synthetic drugs uh, will be used, like ecstasy, <coughs> amphetamine, derivatives, and old drugs like cocaine, cannabis. And they were used in, in the party, party field. And, and especially ecstasy was very new, and nobody knows about the effects and the side effects. And um, so we built an organized club for prevention. We produce, we produce information sheets, leaflets, and something like this. And uh, we spirit out to reuse us. How the drugs Excuse me, when you say prevention, what were you trying to prevent exactly? Prevention. Preventing what? Um, prevention of what? We don't want to prevent uh, drug use himself. Um, prevention or prevention means for us um, to educate people to learn um, to take drugs in a safe way. That's, that's our, our uh, prevention approach. And um, yes, um, we, we uh, make safer use structures and safer use rules. And 
and um, there was a big problem, it's a problem as well now. Um, nobody knows really what is in the drug, what's the content of the tablet or the white powder or something like this. And um, so we went uh, to the Charité, to the Forensic Institute of the Charité, and asked to test drugs for us. Which is the, the, the hospital, right? Charity Hospital. Charity is hospital, and yes, it's a special department of this hospital. And um, they uh, allow us to work together. And so we brought, we brought the drugs to the Charity, and they analyzed for us the drugs, quantity and quality, the content and um, the percentage of MDMR, it's the uh, main substance in ecstasy. And uh, after two days, we told the users uh, who give us the drugs what is inside. And if there is a bad substance inside, um, we make flyers and we spirit the flyers in the techno party scene and uh, they don't take these drugs because there's a very dangerous substance inside. Were the users <laughs> were they they probably weren't happy to wait two days for it. Right? Yeah. Yes, um, so maybe um, at the beginning of the program, um, some of the users, it's not so easy for them to wait. But um, usually, um, people who went go in the techno scene, um, they um, do a recreation um, drug use. They, they are dependent. And so it's possible for them to wait. And it's possible for them to organize, organize their um, drugs consumption and their um, maybe uh, handling of drugs. Is this program still going now? No. Uh, the police stops this program. Uh, um, the, the policy here in Berlin and um, the police as well don't want this program. And so uh, they go to our, to our office and then they went to, to Charité, to the lab, and they stop. Um, the program by police forces. Before the end of this program, it was very, very um, good program. The users wanted, and uh, I thought it was very successful. Um, but um, to this time, the policy don't want it. And uh, now, now um, uh, we are planning to reorganize this program um, uh, together with. Um, the helping system here in Berlin, truck helping system, and with the policy, with the Green Party, my party, and with the lefts, maybe with SPD, it's a little difficult with this party. <laughs> you know. yeah. And um, uh, maybe um, now we have elections in the, in the summer, maybe after the elections um, we will run a, a new drug checking program here in Berlin. But that was called the drug check, check, checking program. Right? That's uh, called drug checking this this procedure. How can uh, how can Charité be involved in taking street drugs and testing them? It doesn't in yeah. receiving those drugs is that actually illegal? Those, those street drugs like heroin, I think, like it's cocaine, heroin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, um, in in the nineteenth, when the program was running, uh, they make no. Um, they don't distinguish between street drugs and party drugs and um, maybe pharmaceutical drugs. They tested all kind of drugs. But it's um, to receive the drugs in the first place. Aren't they actually committing something which is illegal? I mean, why, what makes a member of staff or charity any different to somebody? Is it not a crime for the hospital to accept people working at the hospital to accept the drugs into the hospital? Did they get legal problems with the police? I'm wondering why they shut it down. Was it a it's, matter of it's, 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 the police say it's illegal, and so they make repression acts to to the hospital and to us. Uh, and then um, we have um, a trial at a court. The court says we are right. It's legal to test drugs and to support people who are drug dependent or who use drugs. Uh, with a service like this. It's, did, it's you, legal. did you take just a sample of the drugs or did you, I mean, surely you didn't give them back to them after the process? It 
So it's, Im it's impossible to become the drug spec. That's illegal. We, we take only a short amount of the drug, and it's enough to analyze it. And the rest of the drug, the powder or the tablets, are still by the users. So charity was acting as a yes a pure and consultancy service. Yeah. Okay, so you have to know that in other European countries um, we have this service now, yes, and maybe in Austria or Switzerland um, there are mobile labs who are coming to a party. And on the party they make a lab in a separate room. You can go to this lab, bring the amount of your, your drug to this lab, and after 20 minutes, you know what is uh, the content of this drug. That's the, um, that's the service in Switzerland in Austria. So, so any all drugs from from ecstasy to heroin were were being tested in, the, in this yeah. program. We make no difference. Every every drug, huh? but um, you have to know if you want to um, 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 get people maybe from the street scene, from the heroin scene. Um, you have to go to other places, yes, because um, the scenes are a little bit separated. Huh? If you go to a techno party, you get party trucks like amphetamine, ecstasy, cocaine, and if you want to test heroin or so-called street drugs, um, maybe you have to go to a injection room or uh, maybe to to, to Hermannplatz or some places where the scene is uh, located. Okay, thanks, Tibor. Um, so, Ruby, um, maybe you can. Uh, Ruby actually has an article in, in this edition of our magazine, and um, perhaps you could just, in a rel relatively brief uh, way, sort of summarize uh, your experiences uh, since you arrived in Berlin. Okay. Um, obviously, the two people sitting on either side of me have perhaps a, a professional interest in uh, um, drugs and their consumption and so on and so forth, or their legalization or anything of that sort. My, my interest was amateur, but the reason why perhaps I'm sitting on this panel, um, apart from of course my, my you know, charming public speaking abilities, is um, well, as you said, um, Berlin is known as a relatively decadent city and people are attracted from all over Europe and elsewhere to come here and they associate, perhaps before they've even arrived, Berlin as a place where you can party and you can do whatever. The difference, or why I'm sitting here, is that my drug consumption, which happened before I came here, but it became much more extensive in Berlin, um, became the absolute focus of my life for a number of years, without turning this into a, a, my own private NA meeting. Um, I ended up, I came here in 2006, and I would, I would think that my drug consumption prior to that was not any greater than your average drug-consuming, party-going individual. However, having come here, I uh, became quite quickly involved in, uh, in heroin, and that, in turn, of course, got me addicted. And then I became not only buying it from the places and the, the locations that I mentioned in the article along the U8 and on train station platforms and so on, but uh, uh, I became involved with a, a slightly higher level of, of dealers and um, you know spent, wasted a lot of time watching them play video games in their drug dealing pads and um, taking other sorts of drugs, cocaine a lot, and uh, uh, crack when I could get it, and um, not that any of this is anything other than anecdotal, but my 
entire experience with those drugs, heroin especially, and trying to stop using, and trying to stop using here, because I also didn't want to leave Berlin. I was determined, or I, yeah, I was determined not to leave. You can take any drug user and take them somewhere where there are no drugs, and then they won't take any drugs. That seemed to me to be rather missing the point, which is that if I started doing all of those things here, then the only place where I could psychologically stop doing them would be the place where they would still be available. Anyway, those experiences with dealers, many, many addicts, uh, and then subsequently now that I have stopped taking heroin um, in the world of substitution, methadone, subutex, the, you know, the, 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 the doctors that you see and the, 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 the social workers that you liaise with means that while I don't have any axe to grind or agenda to pursue here on this stage, I do think that it maybe rather qualifies me to talk about Berlin's unique attractions aside from its East Soviet architecture. Thank you. So, Stefan, maybe you just want to talk about um, what you do. Uh, so, uh, I'm a happy cannabis user. So, uh, most of the people I know take drugs in a responsible way and they don't get addicted or something like this. And especially when I was younger, uh, this was a, the usual case. I'm a fun kid of the 90s, as we say today. So I learned a lot about drugs from older people out of the techno scene. And yeah, one day in 1998, there was uh, my first contact with the police uh, in Bavaria and Nuremberg. So this was kind of the, the black side of the drugs I enjoyed for years before. And so I started to ask myself, uh, why is there so much injustice from the state while there's so much fun in the drugs? And I started to uh, do drug policy, especially related to cannabis. But uh, after years and years, I learned that there's nearly no difference between drugs because uh, normally the people take drugs to have fun, to experience other point of views or something like this. And so the motivation behind drugs is nearly the same, uh, independent of the substance they use. So why is there a different approach and policy? So I. Uh, learned to think uh, substance don't care, care about the consumer, to, uh, try to avoid misuse, try to teach the people use, and that's the point of drug policy I'm doing. Uh, especially in the cannab cannabis community, there's a lot of uh, hate against consumers of other drugs. For example, heroin is kind of a loser drug, so uh, I'm a part, big part of my work is to fight for uh, the consumers of other drugs because they're humans too, they have human rights. It's not uh, cannabis is the one happy thing and all the other drugs are shit. So even cannabis consumers have a lot of way to go until we have a legal state. Uh, I've written a book about cannabis and uh, I'm organizer of the hemp parade. For example, Tibor is uh, our guest there, will have a speech on the 10th of August this year, maybe you'll all join us. And what are you, what are you doing to, I mean, how do you actively sort of fight for legalization other than the parade? What else do you do? Uh, I have a drug policy website uh, called Usual Red Art. You don't have to remember the name, just uh, Stefan and Cannabis into Google, that's me. Uh, I'll do speeches, for example, on last uh, weekend we had a, a psychonautic congress in Berlin uh, where I had a speech. Uh, I'll do political work, for example, I've uh, written the drug policy program for the Pirate Party in Berlin. Uh, all this kind of work, and I do the regular work in the Ad Museum. So today my first work in the morning was a group of 20, 14, 15 year old people want to know something about 
cannabis, especially as a drug. So I teach them half an hour natural resource, cannabis as medicine, and then half an hour cannabis as a drug, and nicotine as a drug, because most of the cannabis users have a kind of a nicotine addiction. So, Stefan, I mean, maybe, um, I mean, for, so I was saying earlier, Berlin is really, I mean, a lot of people have this idea that Berlin um, is a very liberal place. Uh, in terms of drug policy, but it seems like you have a different opinion. I mean, uh, it's kind of liberal from a consumer's point of view. So you're really free to consume, for example, a joint in most of the clubs is not a problem, or a fast line of cocaine is not a problem. But it's uh, not a liberal city from the law point of view because cannabis is still illegal. We have uh, several thousand arrests every year related to drugs. If you want to get rid of your neighbor, just call the police, tell them there's cocaine. So they will come and kick out the door. Uh, there, there's a lot of effort from the police and from the state to get rid of the drugs, but there's no way. So there's a, a lot of political work for me. Yeah, please. Uh, there, there is uh, an amount of people who are addicted to drugs. Uh, there is no substance beside of nicotine uh, where the majority of consumers are addicted. Nicotine, it's uh, 8 out of 10 people who consume nicotine are addicted. Uh, for example, cannabis is 2 to 5 percent. Heroin is nearly 40 percent. Uh, so if you have an addiction, you need help, but you don't need a jail, you don't need your driving license away, your job away, you don't need a uh, social uh, disintegration kind of all these uh, efforts our community is making to get rid of drugs is actually making the life of drug users worse than they have to be. Yes. There is no drug who is getting uh, healthier if the mafia is doing the business. I don't want criminals to teach our children. I don't want criminals to control the purity of drugs. That's a job for the society. If you're addicted, then there, the problem is not the substance, but the addiction. If so you so, any, so any, anyone, any tourist can get up, should be able to get off a plane, um, go on his way to Bergheim, get like some cocaine at the pharmacy, or I don't know, like how should that work? How should that practically actually work? I mean, it, so, it seems uh, very unrealistic. Oh, that's uh, not true. A hundred years ago, there would be some guy around here selling cocaine, selling heroin to the people just on a regular basis, like we drink beer today. The, the problem isn't the drug, but the wrong drug policy, because if you get uh, the drug consumers to the mafia, then we have a problem with a lot of uh, negative stuff in the drugs, we have a problem with uh, unknown purity, we have a lot of problems with the, the social uh, circumstances of drug consumption. Uh, Ruby, I think you wanted to respond to yeah. what Stephen just said. What's so good about drugs? Why? Why? I mean, no, if I may, to elaborate on my question. Um, why? You said that 14 and 15 year old kids came and you educated them about cannabis, but it seems to me that there are two different things. If you're talking about how criminalizing drugs enables um, enables criminals to profit off them, uh, um, then that and cutting them with other things and making them impure and so on and so on, then that is one thing. But the other point is, why would you advocate? What are you advocating? Are you advocating more people smoke marijuana? Are you advocating? I advocate everybody smoke marijuana from time to time. Why? <laughs> because drugs are part of our life. Even animals do drugs. If you have uh, alcohol-containing drugs, then yeah, that's fun for animals. 
we're animals too, so we need a, a way to get rid of the life outside. We're four million humans in a place called Berlin. That's not a human kind of way to live. We need some place to get away, and that's what drugs are offering. If I get drunken today because it helps my English, I will use a coffee tomorrow morning to get out of my bed. That's what drugs do for everybody. Maybe just a little wise. First, legalization doesn't mean you have to take drugs. It just means there's a legal way to get your drugs. You don't have to go to a dark spot somewhere in a park and buy drugs you don't know which quality and maybe get rid of them if you can step out of the park. And second, uh, yes, we need help to people, but there's no help in police, there's no help in jails. So we need a legal state of drugs because that's the way to help people. Get them rid of, out of the mafia, get them out of the uh, injustice. Don't underestimate the pleasures of breaking the law. <laughs> um, I saw a man in the audience. I'd like to open this up to the audience right away. And then a man over there itching to make a comment or a question. One of the big problems in the whole discussion about legalization is if you say prohibition is bad, you don't necessarily have to say drugs are good. But they are. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to I mean, you can't say, can you say that heroin good. is a good thing? And, and especially, just, just a second. Heroin uses on your side. Say that. Say something, please. But it's a pretty yeah. documented. Let me continue for a second. Well, there's 95% of people who are not addicted and can use the drug yeah. without problems. That's yeah. the thing. Is that, is it, 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 say we're talking about very hard stuff like heroin, can you say that 95? Hard stuff? Let's <laughs> Ruby, Ru I mean, you've perhaps, you've got a lot of experience with heroin. Can you, would you call it hard stuff? <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's the short answer. Yeah, so a knife is a hard stuff too. Knives kill people. But it's the people who use knives to kill well, that's people. The same it's not the knife. If I may, if I may Stefan, that's, that's the same that's argument that the NRA uses exactly. about the proliferation of guns. So you are, ironically, given that you probably identify yourself as a left-wing individual, are using the same tautology as 
people that many, including you, probably consider to be neo-fascists. Mm. Uh, so I, I work with addicts on a daily basis because they call me if they have problems with the police. So that's a, a, a really huge problem. And we can, don't get rid of drugs by using police and by using jails. We learned this lesson in 40 years. There are pe more people dying because of the war on drugs than people are dying because of drugs. So w where is the sense of it? If you want to make a, a more human world, then stop the war on drugs because it's doing more harm than drugs could ever, ever possibly do. No question. But, you know, if you say stop the war on drugs, wonderful. But the problem that always arises if people mix it up you know, with making drugs look funny, easy going. I'm a drug user, I've had times of no problems and times of problems, you know? And if anybody said, you know, the prohibition is senseless in a way. Uh, the use of drugs is normal and in many people, I'm working in the field, it just turns into a personal havoc. And if one always says, yeah, but nicotine is, uh, much worse and all this, and most of the people don't have any uh, big uh, problems with uh, drugs and all this. It doesn't help much that one, you know? You just have to make a clear division between A, that the state doesn't have a fuck to say what we take and how we live, if we don't harm other people, and B, that there are very powerful plants and substances on this planet, and one has to be really wise in the decision whether to take them, when to take them, how to take them. And we always have to keep these two things apart. And then the moment we mix them up, we give follow to all the people that want to continue the drug on wars. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I feel like everybody's getting pretty dogmatic with Stefan. I mean, I don't know, I come from Pennsylvania, where every second person owns a gun. And I don't own a gun, I don't believe in it. I don't take heroin because my cousin took it and I saw people smoking crack one time and I don't want to do it. I think he's just talking about education. Yeah. And just educating people, you don't, these laws on drugs, I mean, more than anything in Berlin, it doesn't stop anybody from doing it. It's just better educating the people, just like he's testing drugs to make sure that it's... No, but I mean, I mean, he's not, he's not just talking about education, right? He's talking about legalizing everything. So I think there's two different things. I think I think everyone everyone will agree here that that we need education and uh, oh, there's one point that education add. is great and basically just like purely uh, war and drugs is stupid like a pure war and drugs is stupid legalization uh, could help with some drugs but I think it's a mixing up of it everything. We're on totally two different good. issues on it just like this guy said. I mean. On the one point, he's talking about a legal side of issues, and that, that comes down to a lot of things, political, legal, social, blah, 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 blah. And on the other hand, whether taking every drug is good. I mean, that's up to the first one. Okay, okay, that's not even that, but who's good? But I do think like this argument is getting marked because we're like not arguing each point separately. We're trying to argue like two points at once, and the conversation gets convoluted that way, rather than... Uh, I, I wanted to say something to a Harry and Field. Um, first of all, as we saw the, the, the criminalization of the users and the criminalization, criminalization of, the, of the drug market, heroin market, was a catastrophe. Yes. Um, for, uh, makes much pain for the users and um, uh, um, many users were infected by, by HIV because of um, needle changing and something like this. And, um, uh, Nobody knows the purity of the heroin, and it's very, very um, dangerous uh, to use heroin if you don't know really the purity. If it's very high, a lot of people uh, die in, in one week. Yes. Um, it was uh, a very bad thing um, uh, to criminalize um, the market and uh, the users. And um, so we. Um, um, try a new way to, to handle, to deal with, with heroin. And um, we don't say um, legalization like cannabis, and um, we don't say heroin for everybody. Yes. And, um, we uh, made um, heroin to a medicine truck, 
Yes? And, and we say, if you are dependent by an opioid or by, by heroin, um, you have to go to the doctor, and then it must be possible to get, to have a choice. Maybe you want to be clean, then you get uh, clean uh, therapy, and, um, um, yes, uh, detoxification, something like this, or maybe you want um, uh, substituted by, by methadone or uh, drugs that, uh, like this. It must, must be possible, it must be very easy. Isn't there, a new, isn't there a new program starting very soon in Berlin where a doctor can yes. prescribe heroin? Yes, yes. Can, you, say can you explain you, it a little bit? If you want, you, you, have to, you can become, um, you can get um, heroin as well. Yes? And um, that was a very hard way to, 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 be, uh, to come uh, to this uh, stage. And um, first you have to make a testing program Berlin was not in, in this uh, testing program involved, only um, cities, uh, big cities in West Germany. And so uh, the Berlin drug policy, especially in the 90s, was not very, not, not very liberal. Yes? It was more repressive than liberal. And, um, liberal was Hamburg or Frankfurt. Yeah? And uh, these cities tested um, to, to, to uh, treat dependent people with heroin. And this program was very successful. And so um, the German policy, the Bundestag and the Bundesrat, uh, allowed now um, to treat drug dependent people with heroin. And in this summer, um, we will start a heroin program in Berlin as well. And so it's possible for drug dependent people to get heroin. Uh, uh, not so easy. Uh, you have to be. You have to have uh, uh, big therapies. Yes. You have to make make anything. And the main thing is, um, you know, the Green Party, for instance, they say, <clears throat> all right, we'll, we'll make it possible for the heroin addicts to get heroin from the doctor. And they think how it's going to be in Berlin. Three times a day, you've got to go to the doctor. Do your shot. There's no offer for heroin smokers, by the way. You do your shot, and then you've got to wait one, and then you've got to wait one or two hours in the doctor's vicinity uh, to see if you don't get an overdose and uh, fall down dead. Um, so it'll be like six hours a day for three meager shots you got to spend in the doctor's office. And who actually? I see your grin. Would you have liked that? Uh, I wonder. Uh, and so here we are again in the big dilemma. They say, oh, give cannabis free. That's, I love it so much. And uh, give it free. But the hard stuff, I don't have to do with it so closely. We still have to regulate it somehow. You know? We still want to fucking regulate it. Like the Green Party. And I don't know what the pirates say. They say whatever. Uh, but on the other hand, you know, as soon as we begin to regulate the old stuff, Cocaine, heroin, whatever. We'll have a black market, we'll have the mafia back again. And so, even although I see every day the utter misery of hardcore drug users, on the other hand, I say, just give it free. If you want to get rid of mafia, impurities, if you want the market to regulate quality and price, and then we'll have a lot less problems. And on the other hand, if we, Berlin, it's not only fucking West Berlin anymore, you know, because Berlin drug policy is still a very West Berlin thing, if you take a look at the protagonists of all this. Uh, and we just have to get clear, you know, that we draw a lot of people and that we spread out a lot of whatever, we emanate a lot of information and energy and all this. And we have to use it in the city to make a stand to legalize. Are, are you sorry? Uh, are you involved? Are you an, an activist or an advocate? I'm a social worker in the drug field. Yes. Okay. Um, I'd be curious to hear from someone else in the audience who hasn't spoken yet. I have a, a different angle to this. Um, Please. I'm half Bolivian, and I've seen uh, lots of problems in my country. Uh, I've 
and uh, I'm mostly worried about uh, peasants being dependent on these crops, you know, coca leaf or alternatively poppy leaf, and how eradication does not work. And just it's the only thing that they can actually make money out of because the, the whole country is dependent on, on first world countries and, and their economies. And uh, nature is being destroyed because there, there are no, uh, there's no sewage there. So you just have to dump all the gasoline, the kerosene, the acetone, and what, it, what else. And it's causing a lot of trouble. It, also here in Europe, in the last edition of Vice magazine, the, the German version, they showed how all the, the, the excess, or whatever you call it, of, of these chemicals that was uh, used in producing MDMA, is just dumped in the national forest. So you think so? legalization of all these substances would and regulation and environmental regulation around the world would solve these problems? It would definitely help a lot. And I'm also worried about on the side of taxation. And also, if you keep it, if you keep the, 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 the skeleton in the closet, people are, of course, not even going to be willing to educate themselves. They're just going to keep it in the closet, you know? And they're just going to live in a um, half reality, not ignoring that. So it's better to be aware of the demons uh, I personally would never try cocaine, never would try heroin. Uh, would try to, if I, if I get in trouble with some of these drugs, I would try to cure them with, with uh, natural drugs such as ayahuasca or something, which has, 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 has helped some people. In fact. Which is actually, has a gray, a legal gray zone, doesn't it, ayahuasca? Yeah, so it's, for some people it's a religious sacrament. Um, it has actually a dark side. There's a story of this guy in, in, in Chile, uh, which even Graham Hancock talked about in his website and Facebook said uh, one guy thought he was God and uh, he said, uh, okay, you have to have, have a child with me for this woman and, and then the child was the Antichrist and he killed the baby again. That's how <laughs> weird we were. So, that's the ring. I did, um, I wanted to ask you, um, uh, a few months ago I read in the, in the Tats, uh, there was a story about um, a journalist had met a a dealer in Bergheim and who was offering fair trade cocaine. <laughs> have you heard about this story? I'll try with that, maybe. <laughs> I mean, have you heard about this? I mean, is that, is that possible? Is, I mean, I don't know. And then he asked himself, how can you guarantee that? Is there like a bio, like a certificate or like a symbol on the package? Or? I think it's a good idea to um, 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 sell fair trade. Um, cocaine. Um, until now, it's uh, totally unfair traded. Yes. Um, the conditions uh, where um, coca is produced and uh, it's uh, sold and, um, is very unfair yes, because um, of um, the illegal structures, um, because of the illegalization of, of, of cocaine. Yes. So um, illegal structures control um, the, the uh, cocaine treatment, you know, treatment, uh, but the dealing with cocaine trafficking. And um, but, uh, I think that's a very bad thing um, for people who have to produce it in, in South America or Latin America. And, um, and then on the other hand, um, uh, the production and, and the people who produce it, who plants um, cocaine, um, were um, fight, fighted by, by the war on drugs, um, which is um, uh, it's coming from, especially from the US. Yes. And so it's um, uh, where a lot of violence in these countries um, because of um, the wrong um, trafficking of, 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 of cocaine and uh, wrong global trading of, of cocaine. So we, we have to change um, fundamentally the rules of, of, uh, um, of, of um, trading cocaine. Ruby, did you ever think um, when you were doing heroin that maybe that you did you ever think about how you were sort of basically funneling money into the Taliban? No. <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, well, actually, to put it differently, uh, the, uh, being addicted, I understand what both of these two gents are saying, and I understand the difference of taking drugs recreationally to being addicted to them, and obviously those are, are, are very different things, although I also think that 
to lump all drugs together since they are all mind altering in and you know emotionally altering in their various ways is is a massive oversimplification and also the evidence of mental illness and drug addiction is pretty clear but anyway um, in answer to your in answer to your question um, I was aware of that peripherally you know um, but as far as I was concerned, uh, aside from the fact that being addicted, you just want to be okay, which means, uh, you know, buying buying drugs or buying heroin, uh, however often you must get it, you know, to be all right, to continue to function, to get more heroin, to continue to function, to get more heroin. Um, um, I, uh, what was I going to say? <laughs> I actually enjoyed the illegality of... of, of well, that, that kind of goes against your it. argument, isn't it? Perhaps you would have never become addicted if it had been easily available, clean, and there was none of the romance of going down to the Uber and to get it. Yeah, that, that, that's true, but um, I, from what I think about addiction, as opposed to drug use, enjoying taking things and, and, and you know enhancing your experience of whatever it is you might be doing, by taking this or that. Addiction is a, I don't believe that addiction is an illness or a disease as AA or NA would lead people to believe. But I do think that it has a certain pathology and that it, 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 it there are individuals, look, I, I started taking drugs. Yes, it was more available in Berlin than elsewhere. But on the other hand, as I told you earlier, there are many, many people that come to Berlin who had probably taken as many drugs as I did before they came here and didn't end up sticking needles in their feet, you know? And so there was, an, a, a, for whatever reason, there are things within me and there are things within any addict that you'll meet that makes them prone to the abuse of not only substances as well, you know? I mean, I, I found after uh, um, going into treatment, uh, I had a little uh, gambling addiction, you know, which I have no interest in whatsoever, yeah, but, you know, uh, passing the time or whatever. And But my point is that um, those tendencies, I think, are inherent in... Do you really, well, do you really that? I mean, you just, you just basically categorise big chunks of the population and make it stable. Can you speak up a bit? You just categorise the large portion of the population by making a suggestion that they are predisposed to addiction. Do you believe really that that's the case? Because I think it's a, I think personally that's rather an overstatement. I think everybody has the potential to be that kind of individual when their opportunities are not suitable or when their state of mind is not suitable. So I don't think anything is quite so black and white. And well, well I, don't, I don't really think it's quite so black and white either. I think it's an incredibly complex network and interaction of your background, your personality, your environment, and opportunity, as you say. I mean, you can even talk a little about, about the supply chain as being something that's not so black and white. I watched a documentary by the BBC about the production of cocaine, and for sure the cartels in these, uh, in these uh, environments where it's produced are uh, distinctly dubious organisations. There was also the sort of the clear idea that the sort of grassroots producer of the cocoa leaf was actually putting shoes on his children's feet by what he was making from the sales of the cartels. I'm not saying it's right, but the, the, the reality is his child was smiling, whereas you know, otherwise it wouldn't be. Now, how do you qualify those those dichotomies? I don't know. Well, I mean, how could I? I, I? I I bought some drugs in Berlin, and I I I've never been to Colombia, and I've never uh, put shoes on shoeless children or watched their drug dealing dads do it either. So. I think it's difficult to be black and white. I think it's like addiction, whether it's a social environment. So there's a comment in the back, lady in the back. Yeah, it's probably more to you too, Bob, but um, a couple of Latin American states, such as um, Colombia, Venezuela, and um, Bolivia, have recently started talks about legalizing the drug trade, especially in the field of cocaine, and like also expanding the use of cocaine not only as a drug, but also all the other products you can gain from it. 
and they are um, proposing talks with Western countries um, starting next year. Do you think that uh, maybe legalisation in South America will like, further help maybe legalisation in Western countries? Maybe Tibor Stephen or legalization of cocaine to you. In South, in South America, if they legalize it there, will well, they have a yes, uh, influence here? There is a big movement yes, um, uh, to, to um, regulate or to legalize, legalize um, cocaine production in South America. And uh, I think it's uh, very important um, to do that uh, or to, 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 to do that in a controlled, regulated manner. Yes. Um, because um, the uh, criminalized production in South America is a disaster for this, uh, for this part of the world. Uh, uh, that's, that's, that's the one hand. Um, but on the other hand, um, you have to see that um, our demand of, of drugs, our demand of cocaine here in Europe, in USA, Canada, and Australia, um, that is the motor of this um, um, uh, trafficking. Yes? And um, if you want um, to make a big solution, yes? and, uh, um, then you have to uh, think on both sides, on the production and, and the demand. And, and um, maybe you have to, you have to, to, to legalize, and you have to, to um, under 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 um, control and license um, the production in South America, but um, on the other hand, um, you have to find ways um, for uh, a legalized or a regulated market um, on, on, on the demand, on the drug demand side, maybe here for us uh, in Europe or in, or in North America. Can I also reply to your question? Yeah. That's been. That's been an effort since the 70s. I mean, even Pablo Escobar said, you know, that Wall Street and the CIA are really into it. But oh, you know, it's just a, because we don't know, let's not pay attention to him. And now in 2012, December, now we know that Wall Street and crime is mainstream. I mean, they're no longer big to, too big to fail, they're too big to jail. Look it up on Rolling Stone magazine. And uh, we're in a catch-22 right now. We cannot jail these motherfuckers. Uh, but we, it's, it's going to happen at some point, and I do believe that it, the, the, the domino has begun to topple in South America with Argentina or Uruguay with their at least marijuana laws and others. I don't know specifically how they, they, they will punish you for what you can, but it, it has started, and I hope that they take it further, Guatemala and Mexico as well. And if they, if they, if they do that first, then the Americans are going to be just standing there like, uh, oh shit, I'm an emperor without clothes and I'm too dope to realize that. Stefan, Stefan, mate, um, how do you how do you see like what you're doing in an international context? Like, do you work with people from around the world? Um, uh, yes, I do. Especially in case of Coca, there's a, a lot of international connection. Uh, I'm part of an organization called NCOT. It's the European Coalition for Just and Effective Drug Policy, and we're working on a program to import coca leaves from Bolivia. Uh, together with the Bolivian government because uh, they just uh, went to the World Health Organization and said, yeah, we will step out of the single convention on narcotic drugs uh, if you not allow us to use coca leaves because it's a part of our cultural heritage and it's not a bad drug, it's just a, a bad habit so we don't need the law to control bad habits and uh, then they just went out of the contract and stepped in the next day with the exception of coca leaf. So coca leaf use is uh, legal in Bolivia right now and other South American, Middle American states will follow soon. And it's uh, important to have a legal market for these coca leaf products in Europe because if you can make money out of them, then they will do cocaine out of it because there's a lot of money in cocaine. But how, I mean, how, I mean, you guys, Except for Ruby, uh, agree on legalization. Legal oh, he's agreeing to. He don't want uh, Pablo Escobar to teach his children how to use yeah. drugs. 
he wants Tebo to sell them, not me, for example. So, <laughs> but I mean, how realistic is this? I mean, you guys, you're in the Green Party, which is a small party, and then once you, if you do win the election, then you, you'll have to basically be in a coalition with the SPD, and maybe you'll just have to do what they tell you to. I mean, how realistic is it really? Is it just a pipe dream to think we're going to legalize cocaine and heroin and, and, and everything else? That's a very long way, I think. Yes? Um, but first, we have to change the thinking. Yes? And um, in South America, there, there is a big change. In Europe, we will begin with um, changing our thinking. And in, in, I think um, the biggest uh, border is the, 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 the um, policy of. North America of the United States, as you have, uh, and, and you need it, you need it uh, as well. Uh, and um, that's uh, it's a very hard way, but uh, we have to go this way. Yes? And um, uh, at the first step, um, uh, we want to make an evaluation of the drug policy here in Europe and um, in, on, on, the, on the global level. And um, I think um, uh, that's, that, that's the first step to evaluate it and um, to, to analyze um, the, um, the bad things which um, uh, this drug policy caused now. Yes. And um, then um, I hope then um, we will um, get or we will become on, on the regulation base. Does so anyone else have any questions for our guests? In the back though, yeah. I think uh, the problem with all this, all this legislation and all these laws at the end of the day is it stops us from really talking about the most interesting point is why do we enjoy taking the drugs so much? Why are they so pre prevalent? And the, the thing is we end up talking about what the laws and are oh, we need to do this or we're not able to talk about really what really matters and move forward and say, right, why do we... <coughs> All the society really want to take these drugs in the first place. Okay, well, it's a, it's a question. Uh, there is a good book on this uh, issue uh, from an author called Günter Ahmed. It's called No Drug, No Future, and it's also available in English, so uh, just read it. Uh, we take drugs because they work, and we're not stupid because if we need a little bit change into this direction or into that direction, we choose the tools to get there. So a drug is like a knife or a hammer. If you use it wisely, it will help you to have a better life. If you use it wrongly, then it will hurt yourself. So. I agree, but how do we, uh, how do we explain that well, you know? We're animals. Animals do drugs. That's all. You don't need more excuse because it's natural. Even a fish is doing drug. <laughs> if it has I mean, animals don't, don't like, um, I don't know, they don't like produce the crystal meth. Oh, if they could, they would. <laughs> if, 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 if you give rats, for example, the chance to press the button to get some meat over the meat, they press the button. That's, precise, that's precisely the argument why the, that, surely, that surely is precisely the point of why those things are restricted, because of the fact that they're addictive, given that the animals that you're citing don't have conscious agency in the way that human beings do. If you just spurt some fucking heroin into a little cage and then obviously the rat's going to want it because it's addictive. That's the point. Uh, um, although, I, I should add, I, I, I feel that I'm being put forced into some kind of anti, you know, uh, legalization or, or drug thing, but I, which is not the case. I actually think what Tibor is um, doing with the, uh, or was doing with the checking of drugs and so on and so on is extremely useful and I know people that have have used that service and, and, and have you know discovered things about the things that they're taking and obviously people should know about what they're putting in their bodies the more dangerous the more they should know and Yeah, I'm going to let you talk. But I think it's a big kind of side of the whole debate.
kind of like uh, don't take more consideration here is how much profit and is that out of this kind of old drug, not just trafficking, because we live in a capitalist world, right? So you can make it legal, but you will still have people making a lot of money out of it. And you're talking about you know demand, but demand is always created by by offer as well. That's that's a capitalistic law, right? And you took and you took the good example of cigarettes. I agree, cigarettes are drugs. Who is making money out of cigarettes? Big tobacco companies, states. So will the fact that you will actually give the legal right, move the legal right from like maybe criminal bans which are illegal to criminal bans which are actually legal because they move through you know, like, it's the same thing with, like, weapons. Look, look what's happening with weapons, right? I mean, only states can track weapons, and some states can and some states can't. I mean, how are you going to ever... I, I always feel, I really feel it's a bit naive and idealistic to think that you would just, like, drug people and some people will be very wise, some people won't, but somehow it's going to be this kind of invisible hand of, you know, capitalistic hand that's going to, like, balance out everything and everyone's going to be happy. Uh, if I can give you the compliment back, you all sound a little bit naive too, because we don't talking about making a market for drugs. There is a drug market. It's a billion dollar business. So it's not a point to start the market. It's a point to regulate the market. Please, I, I talk, heard to you, so please help to me. Yeah, but right now. It's a huge market with a huge profit, and these huge profits are part of the criminal side of the market. If you make cocaine legal, then it's the same profit amount like on aspirin or like on beer. It's not this huge, huge gap between the farmer in Bolivia and the consumer in Europe. What about advertising? What about if... Because market forces, as, as you may know, are not static and demand is determined partially by the creation of desire. So would you like to see adverts of happy junkies with needles in their arms looking really relieved and having a wonderful time from fire with heroin just... I mean, I'm, trying heroin. I'm trying heroin. I've tried heroin. I've tried this shit, you know? I'm not a junkie. That, that's still like what... I'm not siding with either one. Like, honestly, I'm not. But I mean, this, this like, dichotomy today is really fucking tiring. Like, well, as I said, I feel that I... It's like, like, okay, we're going from fucking illegal to, like, having advertisements of happy junkies. Junkies, in their arms. Not that was a joke. Not, yeah, I know, but not everybody's going to end up like passed out in the public toilet in the U8. No, but that, but it's not one or the fucking other. I think it's fucking drugs too. And guess what? The thing is, it's like every fucking person's different. And basically, this argument. Ich will nicht eure Hände sehen. Ich will mit euch durch Wände gehen. Und mit Worten Brände legen, am Blatt vom Mund des Sinners wegen.